שדובר לכולכם שבאתם, בעצם לסמינר המחלתי האחרון של הסמסטר, של השנה, אבל לפני שאני מציג את העורך שלנו, אני מנצל את ההזדמנות להזכיר לכם שב-29 למאי, ביום ראשון 29 למאי, נקיים כאן סימפוזיון במסגרת הקואליציה שהיא המנגנון של שיתוף פעולה בין המרכזי המרכז, מלטון כאן באוניברסיטה, בבית מדרסת הרבנים באמריקה ואוהיו סטייט אוניברסיטי שבכל אחד יש מרכז ראשי מלטון וה... נושא של הסימפוזיון זה Insiders and Outsiders, The Construction of Jewish Identity and Culture וזה היה בערב של יום ראשון, 29 במאי אז הקבלת פנים יהיה בחמש, הסימפוזיון בעצמו יתחיל בחמש וחצי והמשתתפים הם בעצם מהצד שלנו יהיה מנחם, פרופסור מנחם הירשמן, מ-JTS, שיעסוק בשאלה מהצד של התקופה של תקופת חז"ל, תקופת העת העתיקה, ומ-JTS, פרופסור בנג'מין גמפל, שיעסוק בשאלה מהתביא של ההיסטוריה של ימי הביניים, ופרופסור רובין ג'אד מהאייסטייק אוניברסיטי, שהיא תעסוק בשאלה ב... לאור ההיסטוריה היהודית המודרנית ולמחרת ב-30 במאי ב-12 וחצי נקיים סמינר, שלא נקרא לזה סמינר מלכתי, אלא שזה האחרון, יש סמינר בנוסף שבעצם יעסוק בהשתלמויות לעניינים שלנו של חינוך של ההרצאות ששמענו ביום ראשון בערב מי שמלמד ביום שני ב-12 וחצי, אני מזמין אתכם לשקול את האפשרות לא לקיים את השיעור, אבל להביא את התלמידים לכאן, אלא אם כן זה מפריע, ממש לא שייך, מאוד מפריע לסדר הלימודים, אני חושב שבעצם זה השיעור, זה אמור להיות השיעור האחרון של הסמסטר. אז נא לשאול. לפני האחרון. לפני האחרון. לפני האחרון. יש עוד יום שני אחר כך? כן. טוב. אז זה ליומדכם. עכשיו, יש לי תענות כבוד להציג את פרופסור סטיבן קפנס, שהוא ה-Murray and Mildred Feinart פרופסור ל-Jewish Studies and Religion באוניברסיטת קולגייט במדינת ניו יורק. והוא... הוא פרסם לא מעט, ובין היתר ספר שאני חושב שנוגע לדברים שלו היום, של Jewish Liturgical Reasoning, שיצא בהוצאה לאור של אוקספורד ב-2007, אז יש ספרים טובים באוקספורד גם. ועוד ספר זה ש... שהוא עשה יחד עם פיטר אוקספורד, The Reasoning After Revelation, Dialogues in Post-Modern Jewish Philosophy. אז אני לא אעבור על כל הפרסומים, אבל מי מטעם שקצת מכיר את העבודה שלו, הוא מאוד מזוהה עם איזו תפיסה, שאני לא יודע אתה, אם זה מטבע שלך, של טקסטואל, של טקסטואל ריזנינג. והיום הנושא של ה... ההצעה של, של פרופסור קטנס זה Liturgy and Jewish Pedagogy from Mendelssohn to Rosenzweig. Uh, אתה מתכוון לעשות את ההצעה באנגלית, אבל uh, בטח אנשים <אנגלית> יכולים <אנגלית> לשאול ולהתייחס כן, uh, אחר כך בעברית. אני ביקשתי מפרופסור קטנס לדבר בערך 35 דקות, משהו כן. כזה, וזה ישאיר לנו משהו דומה לדיון בשאלות, אולי לדברי סיכום שלו. Um, the project I've been involved with for a long time uh, uh, is to find uh, 
um, a way of expressing Jewish thought, Jewish theology, uh, that moves beyond purely conceptual models that uh, we inherited mainly from Western philosophy, and to find the indigenous forms of Jewish thinking, Jews, Jewish reasoning that exists within um, Judaism itself. Uh, so a lot of my early work was on textual reasoning, trying to basically bring a hermeneutical model to Jewish thought, uh, based on Midrash and hermeneutic theory, semiotics, etc. And the recent project I've been involved is to try to see what extent liturgy, Jewish rituals uh, of the synagogue, has within it philosophical, theological, and ethical significance. Now it turns out that um, liturgy, or synagogue ritual, has been an abiding concern for the modern Jewish philosophers. Even those very philosophers who we charge with being too rationalistic, conceptual, themselves, the classic ones, like Mendelssohn, like Hermann Cohen, like Rosenzweig, um, actually themselves thought very long and hard about the textual and liturgical sources of Jewish thought. And that uh, part of their work has been less uh, uh, focused on, and that's what I'm doing today. There are uh, three major big people, Mendelssohn, Hermann Cohen, and Rosenzweig, that, uh, that I think are the, the, the strongest classic uh, German Jewish thinkers on the topic. I'm going to focus on um, uh, Mendelssohn and Rosenzweig, just because I don't have that enough time, but Cohen is extremely uh, interesting, um, and those of you who've read Religion of Reason know that probably half of it is on prayer and, and liturgy. Um, let's see. So, um, practices, behaviors, doing deeds is a hallmark of Judaism. And in turning to synagogue liturgies, thinkers like Mendelssohn, Cohen, and Rosenzweig found a resource in language to bring their ethical and philosophical formulations into the very heart of Jewish religious life. Liturgy as a social practice suggests that Jewish thought itself is a dynamic process in which the body, mind, and spirit are brought into relation to create an intricate network of action and thinking. Through liturgy, one could say that ideas are brought into the Jewish body. I'm going to start with Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn's Jerusalem contains a very important early modern philosophy of liturgy, Jewish liturgy. As you know, Jerusalem is built on a division in Judaism into two rational truths and revealed legislation. Mendelssohn argues that rational truths, like the existence of God, providence, and immortality of the soul, are eternal and available to all humans through the observation of nature and pure rational contemplation. They require no religious training or doctrines to discover. That's rational truth. We all can look at the uh, world and see must have been a creator, etc., etc. Revealed legislation, on the other hand, includes laws that are particular to the Jews, and they were given at one historical moment and revealed through the miracle of God's speech to Israel. Mendelssohn's division of Judaism into two provides the justification for modern Jews to, at one hand, accept enlightenment notions of truth as revealed to them through science and modern philosophy, at the same time that they could give their allegiance to the particular laws and liturgies of Judaism. This allegiance is deserved, Mendelssohn argues, because Jewish laws provide pathways to forge uniquely Jewish ties to the eternal truths of the Enlightenment. Mendelssohn answers the Enlightenment charge that Judaism imposes a heteronymous law on individuals by arguing that the focus on law allows Jews to give their assent to religious truths freely, without coercion. Unlike Christianity, which demands allegiance to prescribed beliefs, Judaism only demands observance of ritual behaviors. This sets the mind free to discover religious truths through an open process of intellectual and spiritual discovery. Mendelssohn sums this all up with his famous words, the law 
did not impel Jews to engage in reflection. It prescribed only actions, only doing and not doing. This great maxim of this Constitution seems to have been men must be impelled to perform actions and only induced to engage in reflection. For Mendelssohn and for most Jewish philosophies that preceded him, and for all the Ger Germans who call it ethical monotheists that followed them, the real threat to monotheism has always been idolatry. Mendelssohn presents idolatry as a freezing of the dynamic process of human discovery of God into fixed images or doctrines. The problem of idolatry for Mendelssohn is thus largely a problem of representation. How does one represent the God who transcends all that is material and therefore lies beyond any representation? The main strategy of monotheism, as Mendelssohn sees it, is to move from concrete pictorial representations of the divine to an alphabetical written script. But the alphabetical script also suffers from problems. I'm going to hand these out. On the one hand, the written script is fixed, and the fixed word can miss the dynamic, spontaneous character of divine presence and religious discovery. On the other hand, the alphabetic script is too abstract and direct and does not foster a process of discovery. We, we have that. Okay, so this is the text. I have one more. Funny. Okay. We have seen how difficult it is to preserve the abstract ideas of religion among men by means of permanent signs. Images and hieroglyphics lead to superstition and idolatry. And our alphabetical script makes men too speculative. It displays the symbolic knowledge of things in the relations too openly on the surface. It spares us the effort of penetrating and searching and creates too wide a division between doctrine and life. Okay, so we have this problem on one hand, representations of God are too, either too concrete, hieroglyphic, or too abstract. Mendelssohn argues that the most creative solution that the Torah offers to this problem of representing God in the process of religious discovery is provided by what he calls ceremonial law. Mendelssohn takes this phrase from Spinoza. But where Spinoza sees ceremonies as antithetical to philosophy, Mendelssohn takes the opposite position that the ceremonies in philosophy are intricately related. Mendelssohn believes, as Maimonides put it, puts it, that all laws, including the ceremonial laws, quote, conform to wisdom. In Mendelssohn's terms, the ceremonial laws prescribes action, actions that encapsulate and point to the ethical and the divine, and also serve to provide stimulants for questioning and contemplation. In addition to this, con this connection to contemplation of God, truth, and morality, Mendelssohn argues that the ceremonies provide answers to the problem of the representation of the divine. Mendelssohn suggests that liturgical practices are uniquely suited to avoid idolatry and present the divine process of discovery because they are at once transitory, embodied, social and inactive. He therefore applauds the law lawgiver of the Jewish nation for the genius of the law, and particularly the ceremonial law of liturgy. In order to, you this is the second text, in order to remedy these defects, the defects of too concrete or too abstract, the lawgiver of this nation gave the ceremonial law. The truths useful for the felicity of the nation as well as each of its individual members, would it be utterly removed from all imagery. For this was the main purpose in the fundamental law of the Constitution, avoidance of idolatry. They were to be connected with actions and practices, and these were to serve them in place of signs, without which they cannot be preserved. Man's actions are transitory. There is nothing, nothing lasting. 
nothing enduring about them that, like hieroglyphics, could lead them to idolatry through abuse or misunderstanding. Okay, so this is the solution to this problem. On the one hand, you don't want too, too concrete or too abstract. So these practices, synagogue liturgy, what I'm calling synagogue liturgy, are an inaction of the uh, worship of the one God who is beyond all image. And because liturgical practices are by definition temporary, they happen, every time they happen, they happen differently, right? You go to Shul this morning, there's going to be a certain set of people there or whatever time you go, 7.30, whatever. Um, and then tomorrow you go, you, by definition, it will be different. There'll be someone else davening in the front. There'll be someone who doesn't show up. Obviously, sometimes the ritual changes, you know, if there's a holiday or whatever. But even if it's the same, it can never be the same. Unlike an image or a or a concrete symbol that's always the same if it's going to worship that cup. You can depend, you can believe it's going to be the same cup tomorrow. But the, litur the lit a liturgical practice dependent upon the people that come, the time, the space, the weather, etc., is always changing, fleeting, but yet the script is the same. We say the same words, and those words uh, talk about the one God and the actions that we uh, uh, involve ourselves in bowing in certain places to the one God. Um, the whole develop, I'll talk more about liturgy itself and how it gives rise to ideas, but this is just for this moment. Mendelssohn believes that he's come upon a unique, and this is the unique solution of Judaism to the problem of idolatry. And it also defeats another problem, which is the problem that I actually started with, that if you're totally, your, your ideas about God are totally philosophical, Maimonides, they're too abstract. They, they, don't, they, don't, they can't enter into what he's going to call uh, religious life. So you've got two problems, and he believes, Mendelssohn believes, that liturgy is the solution to the problem. I, I think it's really quite brilliant. Thus, Mendelssohn develops a pen. What's that? So liturgy equals ritual. I'm just, I'm just liturgy is 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 co the complex ritual of the synagogue. I'm just using it for that. You know, coordinated actions of a group of Kaiser minion. Whereas, whereas the ritual is a in some, in some ways it's a larger category and a smaller category. I just want liturgical usually meant the texts, not, not, not ceremonies. No, I'm using liturgy to talk about the inaction. Of the Sidua. Yeah. Okay. So these the uh, ceremonial actions are tools in the fight against idolatry. They are sophisticated forms of representation, which can be seen themselves as a special kind of script or a symbolic language. That's what he calls them. They are a kind of script. It's quite if you want the Sidua brought to life. through actions, through which a series of moral ideas and theological notions are put forth for human contemplation. So this is getting to the other side, the ideas that are in there. Uh, liturgy represents the philosophical and theological quest for God as a social and communal matter. As I said before, the, the, the liturgy requires a minion it requires coordinated actions of a group. And these coordinated actions of a group come together to make certain theological and, and ethical points. Liturgies also put individuals in touch with wise elders or teachers to, who provide oral instruction as to what the meaning of the liturgies are. Liturgies, quote from Mendelssohn, also have the advantage over alphabetical signs of not isolating man, of not making him into a solitary creature poring over writings, writings and books. They impel him rather to social intercourse and to imitation and to oral living instruction. 
Mendelssohn suggests that Jewish liturgies are vehicles of mediation that not only connect individuals to the community, the young to the old, but liturgy connects religious teaching to lived life. Through liturgy, this is a quote from Mendelssohn, teaching and life, wisdom and activity, speculation and sociability were most intimately connected. As Mendelton takes us through his liturgical reasoning on the performance of ceremonies and ceremonial laws, we might well ask if he has a specific liturgy in mind. During his discussion of the ceremonial laws, he makes a reference to the Shema prayer and the reciting of the Shema. And I would suggest that it serves as one of the main examples for his liturgical reasoning. The Shema is one of the oldest prayers, as we know. Part of its special character comes from the fact that it is derived directly from Scripture, from Deuteronomy, etc. You know the Shema. Uh, Mendelssohn's reference to the recitation of the Shema is as follows. In everything a youth saw being done, in all public as well as private dealings, on all gates and on all doorposts, whenever, whenever he turned his eyes or ears, he found occasion for inquiring and reflecting, occasion to follow an older and wiser man, to inquire after the spirit and purpose of those doings. Mendelssohn's interpretation of the Shema is that it has an essentially pedagogic, pedagogic role. For Mendelssohn interprets the Shema to be a series of opaque signs meant to give rise to inquiry, questioning and reflecting on the central declaration of the Shema, God's oneness and the commandment to love God. The words and signs of the Shema as Mendelssohn says, underdetermined. They therefore require oral discussion to explain and define and teach them. The Shema instructs the Jew to plant markers of the one God and the command to love him on their bodies, it's, it's filling, on the transitional and private public spaces. Thus you should bind them on your arms and on your doorposts. And, on, and at the transitional communal, non-communal spaces of your cities on your gates. This suggests that at all points of movement, at all goings and comings, we have markers of the Shema. The first level of questioning that the Shema then gives rise to might be summarized, summarized as follows. What are these markers and why are they placed here and there? And Mendelssohn's answer might be, the markers are placed here and there on the body and at all points of transition, all private and public spaces, to provide occasion for inquiry and reflection. But the deeper question must be, how is the individual to fulfill the commandment of the Shema? How does the worshiper both recognize God's oneness and love him with all his heart or her heart. Given that the biblical word for heart led means both heart and mind, Mendelssohn seems to be suggesting that the fulfillment of the words of the Shema ultimately require a process of internalizing the meanings of the signs that are placed on the lips of the worshipers and in all spatial points, private and public. Internalizing the Shema requires understanding its words so deeply that they become part of the Jew's very being. The fact that the words of the Shema are to be repeated at all times and all places suggests that, that the un, that understanding, the meaning of God's oneness, and how to love him is a lifelong process. Thus, unlike the rational truths that any individual can learn on her own, according to Mendelssohn's first thing about rational truths. The truths of the Shema require relationship to others to explain and to discuss them. And they require not just any teacher, but one with whom one has a relationship, a parent or an elder communal elder or a friend. Mendelssohn again appears to be fond of the words of the Shema here in his insistence on the need for parental and communal teachers. We may accordingly think, uh, okay, in summary, I would say that Mendelssohn, 
as two main contributions to make to a theory of the pedagogy of liturgy. First, the very form of liturgy as a temporal and performed series of actions provides a good strategy to avoid idolatrous representations of God. Second, Mendelssohn presents the underdetermined, opaque, and mysterious quality of many Jewish symbols in liturgies as occasions for oral and social discussion, perhaps on the model of the Passover Seder. Discussion about the philosophical, ethical, and theological meaning of Jewish symbols. Thus, the signs of liturgies are invitations for oral discussions about the meaning of Judaism and the obligation every, of every Jew is to take these meanings into their very being. Okay, now I have a whole thing on Rosenzweig, but it's now one o'clock. Hmm. Should I do some Rosenzweig? I do. Do it quickly? Yeah. Maybe somebody will ask the question about Rosenzweig. <laughs> oh, okay. So, I think I'll try to summarize this instead of that. Um, what I see in, in, uh, in Mendelssohn is basically the sense that liturgies and the symbols involved, the, op the, the opacity of them, the very fact that their the meanings aren't readily available on the surface, leads us in some ways outside of the liturgy to discuss what the meaning of that thing is. Now, we do, the one liturgy that allows us to do that is the Passover Seder, where it's really part of the Seder that people ask questions. But you don't really stop the rabbi and say, you know, why do I buy three times or whatever? Uh, so, in some ways, you know, it's that for, for Mendelssohn, liturgy leads us maybe outside of the ritual itself to discuss the things that we just performed. Now, I th what I see in Rosenzweig is Rosenzweig saying more something like, within the uh, liturgical practices themselves, certain philosophical, theological ideas are presented and learned. And he's not saying that this that there's no way to access them, the, the lessons, the theological whatever lessons, other than inside the liturgy itself. I mean, you can continue the discussion, but the main thing is what's going on uh, there, uh, inside the liturgy. Now, um, the, uh, I think that the first move that I learned from Rosenzweig is the sense that a liturgy, uh, and the laws that regulate liturgies create a context, a unique context, a kind of a holding station or a uh, theatrical uh, stage um, that's different from other space that we walk around with. That is, you know, it's uh, the, the space of the synagogue. We call, in, in some ways, certainly when we, when we start to do a liturgy, is a different kind of a space than the space out, outside of it. And within that space, and I like to use the model of Shabbat, especially within the 25-hour the period, where we don't work, I mean, Dafka, you know, all the laws try to cut us off from work, really create this special time and space, not only in the synagogue, because outside we don't use a, a car or whatever, create a kind of a large communal home uh, in between and then synagogue space where Jews can enact certain um, theological ideas. Uh, and uh, that's another idea that I get from Rosenzweig that um, uh, Mendelssohn has too, but that um, the ideas, like the idea of creation, needs to be performed. It's not just an idea that, okay, God created the world in six days and that, uh, you know, the creation is good. We enact the goodness of creation by all those things that we do around eating, around family. What, what, is, what does it mean? What does created goodness mean? Uh, and Shabbat, in some ways, gives us, gives us a, a lesson about what that is. Um, it, it's, that, it's that tactile, eating, sensual, being with family, being at home, all that kind. Of, that's what cre the that's what the that's what creation is about. What the Jewish idea of creation is. It's an, it's a whole series of ideas connected to those ideas 
um, or even set off those uh, certain symbols like lighting the, the Shabbat candles, right? We, you know, it's, it seems clear that at least part of that is going back to let there be light, and so it's a kind of reenactment of the first. But then you actually do it, and you, you know, to say that when you light candles, it's different than just saying, and God created the world by saying, let there be light. I mean, it's, it's that enactment. Um, and also, other things about the liturgy that I learned from uh, Rosen's Five, one of the more, the more difficult things, I think, for many of us in, the, in our liturgy is that it's so uh, overdone, if you really read the, you know, like these kind of coronation scene, scenes of God as king that come probably out of the temple and they're very ancient or whatever. What is, what is that about and how do we relate to that? Um, Rosenzweig's sense is that we're really performing the end time, that in the redemption, um, indeed, uh, the world will be transformed, and at, at the redemption time, the, the, uh, the earth will declare the glory of God, and the, and the mountains will sing, and the rivers will sing, and, and um, you know, God will be enthroned. Uh, that's the, and we actually play that out. We enact that in the synagogue um, through the, the liturgy. Uh, and that then is a kind of a, an actual proleptic experience of the redemptive, re redemptive time that we perform. And the, and the synagogue provides us a stage to perform that. And if we don't have any of that kind of sense of what we're doing, uh, I think it can seem totally, even if you do, it may be still weird to you, but um, I think that's, that's what uh, Rosenzweig uh, had, has to contribute, this notion that we are performing elements of creation, we perform the revelation every Shabbat morning when we take the Torah out, and we have the opportunity to hear the, re the words again. And then I have that, this is one of my favorite quotes, which is in the bottom there, right? Yeah. Uh, all of these, the year Balaam's talking ass may give me a fairy tale, but not on Shabbat, wherein this portion is read in the synagogue, when it speaks to me out of the open Torah. But if not a fairy tale, what then? I cannot say right now. If I should think about it today, when it is past, and try to say what it is, I should probably only utter that it's a fairy tale, but not on that day, in that very hour. It is, well, certainly not a fairy tale. But that which is communicated to me, provided I am able to fulfill the command of the hour, namely to open my ears. So that's a kind of, uh, Uber has this kind of sense too, what, what revelation is, that revelation is something that happens in the middle time in our lives, not, I mean, you know, it, perhaps it happens to the Israelites at Sinai, but revelation for us is us rehearing the revelation. Uh, again, taking it, its meaning in. And what I, what I see in this quote from Rosenzweig is, if I was to read it now, the, the numbers thing, then I, it looks fairy tale. But in the synagogue, surrounded by the whole uh, community, having the Torah been taken out in the way that it's taken, the complex, if you ever you know, think about the, the liturgy, of the way we take Torah out and march it around, it actually we know how to do it, you know, so it's not that complicated. But if you come outside and you look at it, what are they doing? Uh, a lot of the things that we, we do, um, if you try to look at them objectively, they're really fairly complex. And the, the movements of people, and the blessings, and the bowing. And, uh, and I think one of the uh, ideas behind that is to dramatize a rel revelatory moment of hearing the word of the Torah as it comes. So there's a revelation, creation, uh, as you all know, Rodents by creation, revelation, redemption, and those three um, series of complexes of ideas and actions uh, are part of the Shabbat liturgy. Okay, so let me just do my summary and then we're. Uh, yeah, I did them in five minutes, that was easy. Therefore, what Rosenzweig adds to a theory of liturgy as pedagogy is first that liturgy